Jamie Heineman was always the quieter, more reserved half of the Mythbusters team, while Adam Savage was arguably the more charismatic of the two. But although Jamie might have appeared pretty low-key on the show, there's been a lot more going on for him off-camera. Here's the untold truth of Jamie Heineman. Surprise, Heineman was once an unruly, underage hooligan. Faced with the prospect of reform school, a 14-year-old Heineman ran away from home and set off on a six-month hitchhiking adventure. When I left home, I had $1.49 in my pocket. It was just enough for me to get a slice of pizza. According to the Christian Science Monitor, the fun ended in California when he got tossed into a juvenile detention center, where his parents later picked him up. It was great. I had a great time. Just before graduating high school, Heinemann's dad convinced him to buy an actual pet shop. Don't touch that! You buy what then you buy it! According to Keith Zimmerman's Mythbusters Tell All, Jamie bought the shop and sold rodents, birds, and animal food. Little boys love snakes. Through the business, he obtained several pet snakes, as well as a lion cub, which he raised on his parents' apple farm. But Heinemann eventually sold the pet shop so he could go to college. So what skills do you need to become a Mythbuster? Well, if you're Heinemann, a degree in Russian language and literature. According to Indiana University, Heinemann has, quote, exploded any myth that studying the humanities will not lead to an exciting and successful career. That may be true, but why Russian? I must break you. Jamie just needed to pick a language for his bachelor's degree, and he liked the sound of it. After college, Heinemann moved to the Caribbean, where he bought a boat, became a dive master, and opened a charter business, according to Mental Floss. Heinemann also met his wife, who was a diving instructor in the Virgin Islands, while running the charter business. But as Zimmerman wrote, after 3,000 dives and two hurricanes, Jamie finally got sick of scrubbing the bottom of his boat and decided to sail it to New York. This one's busted. It's gotta be. All right, let's go get some fish and chips. Sounds good. Mythbusters is a show about two guys living in the Bay Area who build stuff together and bicker like an old married couple. So it's not too surprising that some viewers got the wrong idea about their relationship. Shall we put some of this chaos to work? Sounds tasty. Even Discovery Channel made some assumptions. Adam Savage told The Sneeze. Among themselves, the network wondered if they could do a show with a couple of homosexuals from San Francisco. Fans even wondered about it too. Heinemann told The Age. We got a lot of gay fan mail when the show first started. Something to do with being in San Francisco and being a big, burly guy with a big mustache. But we're both happily married to women. Adam, we happy? Yeah, we happy. Heinemann is best known for Mythbusters, and like it or not, Mythbusters will probably remain his legacy. Am I emotional about the end of the show? Well, yeah, I suppose I am a little bit. We've done some amazing things over all those years. But he's a man of many interests. According to Gadgetopia, Heinemann's M5 Industries even built a soda can chucking machine that was featured in a 7-Up commercial. To make it more convenient for people to enjoy the refreshing taste of 7-Up, I make vending machines that find you. Jamie told The Star, They asked me if I could invent a vending machine that would spit cans out on demand. I told them for the right price, I could invent a vending machine that would send cans into orbit. Hey, cool. Now that Mythbusters is behind him, Heinemann's got some free time. So what's he doing with it? Did he retire to a sailboat in the Caribbean? Is he raising snakes and lion cubs? Nope. Heinemann now invents awesome futuristic devices with the same coolness factor as hovercraft and jetpacks. He's on a hoverboard! Hoverboard! One of his latest projects? Electric shoes. Sure, sneakers with electric lights have been around for ages, but Heinemann's shoes are like moving walkways strapped to your feet. He told New Atlas, They're not intended to be ridden, they're intended to be walked in. They're like having airport walkways strapped to your feet. The shoes have a kind of tank track on them, and they're full of lots of extra stuff like batteries, accelerometers, and infrared sensors that are evidently meant to stop you from bumping into things. Pretty cool concept. But would you expect anything less from this guy? Cool. What's it good for? I have no idea. Out of all the members of the Mythbusters build team, Grant Imahara was arguably the most capable at building stuff. Plus, the man has loads of connections to major motion pictures and tons of experience crafting combat robots. Let's geek out and discover the truth about Grant Imahara from Mythbusters. In 2010, Grant Imahara promised to build a part of television history, and then he followed through on that promise. It all began, as such things often do, on Twitter. 
According to Entertainment Weekly, Imahara had noticed that Craig Ferguson, the former host of The Late Late Show with Craig Ferguson, had taken to calling his Twitter followers his, quote, robot skeleton army. One thing quickly led to another. As Imahara told the Star Advertiser, So at some point, they put two and two together and said, he should have a robot skeleton sidekick. Imahara would prove to be just the man to build it, but there was a catch. The talk show host had to drive Imahara's Twitter followers over the magic line of 100,000. Ferguson quickly rose to the challenge. According to Popular Mechanics, Imahara found his part of the deal considerably more difficult to deliver. He tinkered with the robot while shooting Mythbusters, which meant precious little time for sleep and a huge rush to get everything done in time. Popular Mechanics reports that Imahara soon found himself in something of a bind. With only one week before the deadline, he still needed to write the software that would make Jeff move and build Ferguson's control box. Despite his struggles with the project, Imahara managed to deliver on his promise big time. Oh, that's cold, Craig. The end result was Jeff Peterson, a snarky remote-controlled skeleton. The creation became so popular it even has its own Wikipedia entry, and ironically, that entry is significantly longer than Imahara's. It's our, it's our first day together, so you know we're kind of, kind of working out the kinks, right Jeff? Why not? Ferguson absolutely loved Jeff Peterson, and shortly after Ferguson left the Late Late Show in 2014, Imahara took to Twitter to give fans a much-needed update on everyone's favorite robot skeleton sidekick. For everyone who's asked me what happened to Jeff, I can report that he is safely with Craig in his personal office. And no wonder. If you're in the business of building robots, you probably have to brace yourself for constant jokes along the lines of, your creation is going to kill you. Well, Grant Imahara might not find those jokes particularly funny, he was, in fact, almost killed by his own robot. Several times, actually. According to Make Magazine, the robot in question was appropriately named The Spider. It was a huge, 625-pound walking machine that Imahara built to be strong enough to carry a man. The Spider didn't exactly come alive and try to kill its creator. It didn't need to. Imahara unintentionally created optimal conditions for a full-fledged sci-fi nightmare. The robot was a particularly challenging and complex one to design and develop, and Imahara made the mistake of testing the spider late at night and all alone. Here's how that played out. And apparently that's not the only time the robot could have seriously hurt or even killed Imahara. As he told Make Magazine, Working late at night by myself, there were a few too close calls when the robot almost crushed me. Pro tip, don't do what I did. Never work alone around heavy or otherwise dangerous equipment. According to his profile at the USC Alumni Association, Grant Imahara spent nine years working at Industrial Light & Magic, the special effects company founded in 1975 by George Lucas. And during that time, he got to work on some truly fantastic franchises. We'll get to Imahara's wide-ranging work on the Star Wars prequels in a hot minute, but first, you should know that he also built models for The Matrix Reloaded and The Matrix Revolutions. According to Mauser, he also got to work behind the scenes on films as varied as The Lost World, Jurassic Park, Terminator 3, Rise of the Machines, and AI Artificial Intelligence, to name just a few. As the saying goes, it's all about the friends you make along the way. During the time with Industrial Light and Magic, Imahara got to know two other ambitious model makers, Tori Bellacci and Adam Savage. Grant Imahara isn't the only Mythbuster to work on the Star Wars franchise. As Tested reports, both Adam Savage and Tori Bellacci have built models for the movies, but Imahara's contributions are truly impressive. According to Mauser, Imahara is the guy who brought R2-D2 up to date for Star Wars Episode I, The Phantom Menace, and Star Wars Episode II, Attack of the Clones. From speed controls to radio gear, he replaced R2-D2's inner workings with modern technology. The most visible change? Imahara designed a new system for the droid's light displays. He removed the old rotating color wheel lit with halogen light and replaced it with a custom LED rig that, strangely enough, wasn't specifically designed for R2-D2. It was actually created out of a gadget from the main engines of the Protector, the spaceship in Galaxy Quest. We don't really know which one. What's more, Mauser reports that Imahara was one of three official R2-D2 operators in the United States. 
Sounds like quite the responsibility, right? Well, as he told Nerd Alert, Driving R2 is fairly simple. Um, there's one joystick, the right thumb controls the body. Wondering about the left thumb? Imahara goes on to reveal, The left thumb controls the little hollow eye, so you don't have to do that very often. Pretty impressive credentials, no? It's uh, on your resume. It's on my resume. <laughs> And that's not all. According to Wired, Imahara spent a decade as something of an official backup C-3PO, wearing the golden suit for assorted appearances, including a memorable Oprah segment. I'm here with some of the most popular Star Wars characters, C-3PO! Grant Imahara is one of the many minds behind the iconic Energizer bunny. In 2011, AL.com reported that the Energizer company fell out with the original designers of the mascot and needed to find someone to build new bunnies. Imahara turned out to be just the man for the job. Mauser reports that Imahara personally built the circuit that enables the bunny's famous ear movements and beating arms. He also installed and programmed all the electronics for the bunnies during his tenure with the project. Imahara has shared some deep, dark secrets about the sprightly battery mascot. Despite appearing rather small in the commercials, the bunny is actually about two feet tall, and it's filled to the brim with electronics. It actually takes a whopping 44 AA batteries to get them working. And yes, Imahara assures us they're all Energizer batteries, so you can sleep easy tonight. It apparently took a team of three people just to keep the arms operating like they're supposed to. Imahara's crew built three bunnies, named Earl, Floyd, and Garth. They must have cost the company a pretty penny, as Imahara told AL.com, I can't tell you how much they cost, but if you know what a Ferrari Testarossa costs, each bunny costs that much. And believe us when we tell you, that's the final word on the subject. You know Grant Imahara is a respected robot designer, but you might not know that he's also an expert in the fine art of building potentially murderous machines. He used to make regular appearances on the robot combat show BattleBots, but judging by a 2018 tweet, it looks like he's thrown in the towel on that particular hobby. I've retired from robot combat. My first fighting robot, Deadblow, was almost 20 years ago in 1999. They made it into a toy, and I wrote a book on the subject. Indeed, it turns out Imahara has written what might be the definitive guide to crafting your very own kick-ass machine. And it's appropriately named Kick and Bot, an illustrated guide to building combat robots. This 528-page primer tells you everything you need to know about making robots that wreck other robots, and the text anticipates any problem you might stumble upon as you tinker. In his book, Imahara tells you how to design the bot, what materials and tools you'll need, and where to purchase them, and even where to place the weaponry. Imahara's collection of instructions and techniques come complete with easy-to-understand diagrams. Long story short, you can build a combat robot with simple materials that are available at any electronics and hardware store. So if you're looking to assemble your very own robot army, this is a great place to start. As for Imahara, his building skills were apparent at a young age. Set number 357, the Legoland Fire Station, 1973, was my first Lego set. There's been plenty of fanfare about Jamie Heineman and Adam Savage's BattleBots robot Blindo, but as we just mentioned, Grant Imahara is a respected veteran of the robot combat arena in his own right. We imagine you want to know more about his diabolical creation, Deadblow. It was a sleek, middleweight gizmo armed with a powerful pneumatic hammer. The robot's tenure on BattleBots was a highly successful one. Deadblow was victorious in two middleweight rumbles, and even ranked as the number one robot in Season 3. Imahara remembers his time on BattleBots with great fondness. In 2014, he told Make Magazine, BattleBots is like a really cool party where your robot is your ticket to enter. It's about testing your ideas against smart, tough competitors and about the thrill of combat. Taking damage is part of the fun, and bringing home a giant nut, the trophy, isn't bad either. Even if your work happens to be an impossibly cool combination of scientific experiments and nifty machines, it's nice to go home to someone you love at the end of the day. Grant Imahara would undoubtedly agree. According to Next Shark, Imahara's longtime partner is Jennifer Newman, and she shares many of his professional and personal interests. According to their joint interview for StarWars.com, Newman is also a model maker as well as a costume designer. I have that, that perfect age range where I just I grew up on those 80s films, sorry honey, um, <laughs> yeah. that Grant worked on. 
According to TMZ, Imahara decided to take their relationship to the next level in 2016 and proposed to Newman in a typically fearless fashion. He bent his knee in a Los Angeles restaurant amid 250 guests who thought they were there for a surprise birthday party. The risk, not to mention the $20,000 vintage diamond ring, was clearly worth it. Newman's reply was reportedly, and we quote, F yeah. The name Tomlinson Holman might not mean much to you unless you're an audio buff, but for Grant Imahara, it means the world. According to the USC Alumni Association, Imahara was struggling with his engineering studies, to say the least. As he told TwitTech Podcast Network, I'm falling asleep in my classes. I don't have focus. This, this sucks. A counselor reportedly told Imahara to meet with Holman, who was a professor of cinematic arts and also the man who developed the revolutionary THX sound system. You know the one. Imahara was instantly starstruck and offered his services as Holman's unpaid personal assistant. Holman accepted, and Imahara spent an extremely eye-opening year working under him. Holman's innovations at THX helped renew Imahara's passion for engineering by teaching him creative ways to apply his talents. Then, Holman scored the young man an internship at the company, which turned into a full-time job after Imahara finished his studies. And finally, after three years with THX, Imahara got an even more alluring job with another well-known Lucasfilm company, Industrial Light & Magic. The rest, as they say, is history. Mythbusters was one of the defining shows of early 21st century television, and its stars are proud of the show's safety record. But that's not to say that it was completely accident-free or that no eyebrows were harmed. Here are the biggest accidents and injuries on Mythbusters. Anyone who has watched Mythbusters knows that the setup for each experiment includes plenty of safety precautions to protect the cast and crew and innocent bystanders. It may not look like it, but we're professionals. Do us a favor. Don't try this at home! Whoa! But one day, the unthinkable happened. In 2011, the Mythbusters build team were testing whether a stone cannonball could be fired with the same force as a metal one. To examine this myth, the team headed out to the Alameda County Bomb Range and brought along a self-made cannon that they had used in prior episodes. To start the test, they loaded in a metal cannonball, lit the fuse, and boom, a puff of smoke. But where was the cannonball? As the Mythbusters would later discover, it had apparently bounced off the ground and was sent flying into a residential neighborhood 700 yards outside the range. And when we realized that that had happened, we called off the experiment immediately to help out any way we could. From there, the cannonball followed a hectic trajectory. According to the Los Angeles Times, it smashed a 10-inch hole through one house, bounced off the roof of another, and ultimately came to a stop after hitting a parked minivan. The Mythbusters have described this incident as their worst day ever, and rightly so. I think we all have the same worst possible day ever, and it's going to be cannonball. Thankfully, no one was hurt, but regardless, the network promised to pay for any damages, and Adam and Jamie personally met with the affected families to express their sympathy. The Mythbusters also made sure to be even more safe with their projectiles in future seasons. The cannonball incident aside, the biggest accidents on Mythbusters almost always happened to the Mythbusters themselves. In the 2008 season, Grant, Carey, and Tori decided to test whether a cloud of sawdust that was lit on fire would produce a huge fireball, as a recent viral video had shown. To examine this, the build team built a cannon that shot sawdust into the air, which was immediately lit with a flare. To their surprise, the resulting fireball resembled the one in the viral video almost exactly. But the curious team decided to take things up a notch and build an even bigger cannon. This time, they filled it with a highly flammable powdered coffee creamer. When the cannon fired, the massive cloud of creamer ignited a second later, with the build team standing just a few yards away. Carrie detailed the incident, saying, And then the wind changed and it started coming at us. I had so much fear in my heart, I just started running. Thankfully, it stopped its explosion a few feet away from the group, leaving them all completely unscathed. In the 2015 season of Mythbusters, Adam and Jamie investigated an urban legend which said that a rock caught in a lawnmower could be propelled with enough force to kill a person. So they started by removing the safety features from some commercial lawnmowers and running them over a makeshift rocky lawn. They found that the mowers were capable of launching rocks with enough force to lodge in styrofoam. Additional lab tests confirmed that the flying rocks had similar or even more energy than a gun-fired bullet. This alone was enough to declare the myth confirmed, but Jamie wasn't satisfied. He had so much fun testing the myth that he decided to construct a massive high-powered lawnmower from hell. But the dastardly device turned out to be even more destructive than Jamie had intended. When the giant mower hit a bump, the axle broke, sending the rapidly spinning 50-pound blade flying out of the front of the machine. Even with no injuries, the Mythbusters decided that the machine was too dangerous for further use, and Jamie had to abandon his pet project. Well, 
you know, I intended to go over the top with my lawnmower from hell. And I guess I did. In one of Mythbusters' very first episodes, Adam and Jamie investigate whether using a cell phone at a gas station can lead to an explosion. Testing this myth required the duo to build a gasoline-filled glass chamber, which they would then attempt to ignite with a phone. The episode featured many mini-explosions as the Mythbusters tried to figure out the proper concentration of gasoline to test the myth. But for one of these explosions, Adam was standing just a little too close. I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Am I missing an eyebrow? Adam had a moment of panic when he thought his hair was gone, but he was lucky. The blast only singed off part of his eyebrow. The most unfortunate part of the incident was that Adam had a date the following day, but hopefully his companion was impressed by his dedication to science. According to Jamie, some of the worst injuries to occur in Mythbusters were broken fingers. Ironically, broken while handling safety equipment. Those heavy glass panels that we put up are kind of bad to put your fingers in between if you're not careful. One notable injury of this type occurred to Adam while filming an episode for the 2014 season. The Mythbusters were testing whether an exploding water heater could potentially put out a nearby fire. While assembling the blast shields to house the explosion, Adam got his hand stuck between two of the heavy panes and apparently broke the base of his index finger. According to Adam, he had already forgotten about the injury by the time the episode aired a few months later. That is, until his mother called to ask him if he was alright. Luckily for the worried mom, Adam's hand was already fine by then. Is it possible that the Confederate States of America could have built a two-stage rocket during the Civil War and launched it from Richmond to Washington, D.C.? Adam and Jamie dedicated a whole episode of the 2005 season to investigating this unusual myth. In less than two days, the Mythbusters were able to construct an entire rocket using technologies that would have been available to Civil War-era engineers. But there was one major mishap along the way. Adam and Jamie were pretty confident that they had built a working rocket, so they decided to perform an indoor ignition test. They put the rocket in a big metal shipping container and rigged it so that it could be ignited from outside the lab. When Adam pulled the switch, they heard a massive boom, and smoke immediately began pouring from the workshop. Things were looking much worse on the inside, with huge clouds of smoke and numerous small fires filling the lab. One camera and a few pieces of lab equipment were completely melted by the blaze that the rocket had produced. After the workshop was restored, the Mythbusters took the rocket outside, where it only traveled a meager 500 yards. The myth was declared busted. According to Adam, the scariest experience he had on Mythbusters was the 2010 episode where he escaped from a submerged car. The concept is already terrifying enough, but it's even worse when things don't go as planned. The Mythbusters had already attempted a series of sinking car escapes in the 2007 season, but decided to make the scenario even more realistic in 2010 by flipping the car upside down as it fell into a lake, with Adam and a safety diver inside. The experiment started off fine, but as the unbalanced car filled up with water, it actually flipped right side up and then upside down again. Even worse, once water had completely filled the car, it was a murky brown and burned his eyes. Adam found that he was completely unable to escape under these conditions, so he tapped out, asking the safety diver to pass him the oxygen tank regulator so he could breathe. But like the car itself, the regulator was upside down, and Adam learned this terrifying lesson. And an upside down regulator will give you air, but it also gives you a lot of water. Now disoriented and choking down water, Adam boldly reminded himself to keep a level head. He was soon able to open the car door and escape. The first myth that the Mythbusters ever tested was whether a car fixed with rocket motors could go flying off a ramp at a speed around 300 miles per hour. In the initial 2003 trial, the Mythbusters found that a rocket-boosted car did travel significantly faster than normal, but nowhere near 300 miles an hour, nor was it capable of becoming airborne. Unsatisfied, Jamie and Adam returned to this rocket car experiment in a 2007 episode. This time, they decided that mounting the rocket tubes inside the trunk of the car would allow the system to be more stable, and spent a good portion of this episode rigging a Chevy Impala with this new configuration. They also built a massive ramp that ideally would allow the car to take flight. When it was time for the test, Jamie and Adam watched from the sidelines. It's heading towards the ramp! Or not. While not one of the most dangerous accidents, this was certainly one of the most disappointing. But in a 10th anniversary episode, all five Mythbusters joined forces to revisit the rocket car legend one final time. Anticlimactically, the myth was busted. The car smashed into the ground after only a few seconds of flight. Besides Adam, the build team's Tori Bellacci seemed to suffer the majority of the show's injuries. Tori's worst injury probably came in the 2010 season, during an episode where the build team was investigating whether a person could hold on to a ledge indefinitely. To test this myth, the Mythbusters went to the top of an abandoned building, where they would wear a harness and take turns dangling from the roof. 
Tori went first and was able to hold on with his bare hands for almost a full minute before letting go. Unfortunately for Tori, his fall wasn't clean. As he descended, his shin smashed against an open window frame of the concrete frame below. When Tori was released from the harness, there was a big gash on his left leg that was bleeding substantially. But Tori, the daredevil, kept a positive attitude, telling his companions, I think you should be glad that I was a guinea pig. Oh. In another episode, Carrie and Tori went to a goat farm to find out if goats could really be startled into fainting or falling over. That day, however, the first to fall over wasn't a goat, but Tori himself. While he was holding a handful of goat feed, one curious goat jumped up and kicked Tori in the groin. Whether it was accidental or intentional may never be known for sure, as the goat has declined to comment. Surprisingly, that wasn't the only low blow that Tori received during his time on the show. During a different episode, he and Grant created a model of Ben Franklin's famous kite, but the small kite began to whip around uncontrollably before the rogue device collided with Tori's crotch. No wonder Tori once said, If I had a nickel for every time I got hit in the groin on the show, I could retire. I hope I could still have kids. In the 2014 season, the Mythbusters tested whether Hollywood car stunts were realistic. They busted the notion that it's difficult to push your opponent off the road during a car chase, finding it to be quite easy. Likewise, they busted the possibility of one speeding car driving up another like a ramp. For the final myth, the Mythbusters tested whether a novice driver could tip his car sideways and drive around on two wheels. Adam and Jamie constructed a half ramp that they would drive up with the left side of a car, elevating it onto its two right tires. But after hours of attempting to use the ramp, they found themselves completely unable to control a half-elevated car, or even to keep it on its right wheels for more than a few seconds. When they called in a veteran driver for guidance, their attempts improved somewhat, until they didn't. In one particularly bold test, Adam was able to drive the half-elevated car for almost 10 seconds. I personally think it would be great to roll it, but they tell me that's bad. But then he tilted it too far and quickly lost control. The car flipped completely on its side and then onto its back, skidding for several yards before grinding to a halt. It was an intense-looking crash. The window shattered, spraying the upside-down men with glass. Thankfully, both Adam and the expert driver were okay, even though neither had a helmet. This myth, too, was declared busted. In 2009, two years before the Cannonball fiasco, the build team decided to test a particularly silly myth. Can a person literally have their socks knocked off by an impact? They started the test by putting socks on the show's famous test dummy Buster and hitting him with a massive pendulum. His socks remained on his feet, so it was time to go bigger. The build team acquired 500 pounds of ANFO, an ammonium nitrate-based explosive, and brought it to a quarry outside the town of Esparto, California. They placed sock-wearing mannequins at various distances from the blast point and prepared to examine the results. But the outcome of the test was overshadowed by the sheer size of the blast. The massive explosion sent shockwaves through the town of Esparto, shattering several windows. According to KCRA-TV, one woman was even knocked off her couch by the powerful blast. Luckily, no one got seriously hurt, besides the Mythbusters' reputation, that is. Esparto residents criticized the show for not warning them about the explosion in advance, and Mythbusters had to pay for several window replacements. A later episode revealed that the Mythbusters never returned to the Esparto quarry after that. It's probably for the best. Because of Mythbusters' widespread love and popularity, a lot of people probably think they know all the secrets behind this explosively entertaining show. That would be a myth, though. Here are a couple fascinating facts about everyone's fave mad scientists. Before appearing in Mythbusters, Carrie Byron was a student of film and culture at San Francisco State University, and she ultimately wanted to join the special effects industry. That interest eventually led her to M5, the FX company founded by fellow Mythbuster Jamie Heineman. She was actually an unpaid intern for a while, and that opportunity eventually blossomed into a job offer to join Mythbusters. Everybody loves an intern. They work hard, they're trying to prove themselves, and they are cheap or free. But she never lost her artistic streak. If anything, she learned to marry the more explosive elements of the show into her own artistic expression. One very clear example of this is her explosive paintings. To create these works, she lights gunpowder on fire and then scrapes burnt clay away from the page to make a series of haunting images. She likens the process to, quote, controlled chaos. Exploding pants, killer whirlpools. Have you ever really looked at the sky? <laughs> With so many experiments over the years, you have to wonder if there are any myths the group regrets having busted. Adam Savage apparently wishes he'd ixnayed one segment. Not because the experiment was particularly dangerous or difficult to film, but because it involved magic. At least, that's how Savage sees it. The experiment itself involved determining whether or not keeping a shaving razor beneath the makeshift pyramid would actually keep it sharper due to so-called pyramid power. Savage regrets filming the segment because he believes it was ultimately impossible to apply the scientific method to that particular experiment. 
He believes that they were tasked with, quote, trying to prove a negative, since there was no real way to measure success or failure. Mythbusters was all about science, which means it never let something like corporate sponsorship get in the way of truth, right? Alas, it sounds like even Mythbusters wasn't immune to advertiser pressure. They reportedly decided to axe an entire episode about RFID, that handy technology that lets you wave your credit card in front of a card reader so you don't have to swipe it. You've no doubt heard that RFID isn't necessarily secure. Well, Mythbusters got wind of that too and planned an entire episode about the hackability of the technology. But according to the Register, lawyers for major credit card companies intervened and the episode never saw the light of day. In 2008, Adam Savage opened up about the situation at a Hackers on Planet Earth conference. They absolutely made it really clear to Discovery that they were not going to air this episode talking about how hackable this stuff was. He claimed Discovery, quote, backed down because they relied so heavily upon advertising revenue. That sounds like the honest truth, but something must have happened behind the scenes. Savage later backtracked and changed his tune, saying, The decision was made by our production company and had nothing to do with Discovery. Whatever you say, Adam. Mythbusters was billed as a family show, so there were certain things the program simply wasn't allowed to do. For example, they couldn't even show a simulation of a particular body part while testing the legendary peeing on the third rail myth, even though they were clearly using a synthetic tube. Oh, and in case you're wondering how that experiment worked out... One... Hey! Anyway, according to TV Tropes, censors forbade Mythbusters from airing an entire episode about farting. Knock yourself out! Undeterred, the team tried a segment on farting later on, but this time they followed all sorts of oddball rules, like only using the word flatus instead of fart, supposedly to make the whole thing sound more scientific. To work around all the bodily functions they couldn't show on screen, the Mythbusters team built a fart machine. I am planning to build a machine that can also eject a flatus. That's what all this equipment is. The result was really funny and actually rather vulgar, even though they were basically using a whoopee cushion. Mythbusters was a geeky show. You can gloss over that fact as much as you like, but pretty much every cast member was unabashedly geeky. And if you watched the show, you were pretty geeky too. And what's the holy grail of geekdom? But I was going into Toshi Station to pick up some power converters. Star Wars, obviously. As you can imagine, it's not particularly easy to work something like Star Wars into your myth-busting franchise. After all, Star Wars is a closely guarded property, and there are hoops to be jumped through before you can start busting lightsaber and stormtrooper myths. Adam Savage told The Hollywood Reporter he was surprised how open Lucasfilm turned out to be with their permissions. The team wasn't allowed to animate lightsaber effects, but other than that, they were pretty much given free reign. There was one important provision. Savage joked that Mythbusters couldn't depict stormtroopers shaking their moneymakers. He told The Hollywood Reporter, I don't think they wanted us to twerk with a stormtrooper or something like that. Makes sense, the Lucasfilm people probably didn't want another Christmas special on their hands. Please, please, I have enough aggravation. The Mythbusters had some very public mishaps, but people might not entirely realize just how common it was for the cast to injure themselves in the line of duty. According to CNET, Mythbuster accidents ran the gamut, from explosions to an injury by goat. In fact, Adam Savage once said the show was, quote, four minutes of science and ten minutes of me hurting myself. He holds his breath, tugs on the door, pushes his whole weight against it, but nothing happens. In one infamous experiment, the team wanted to find out if an explosion could actually knock the socks off a mannequin. The explosion wound up shattering the windows of a nearby home. Ironically, the blast quite literally knocked a woman off her couch. Sort of like knocking the socks off a mannequin, but not really. Co-host Tori Belechi's on-set accidents included getting kicked in the crotch by a goat and spectacularly wiping out while trying to jump over a red wagon on a bicycle. I'm okay. Savage was the recipient of one of the show's more serious injuries. He once broke his hand on a blast chamber. Surprisingly, most of the injuries on the show were fairly minor, just stitches and broken fingers. Not bad for a show with a premise that's firmly grounded in blowing stuff up. Hopefully, the safety experts were well compensated. No one deserved that paycheck more. Mythbusters is real science, not mad science. It's not like they ever received orders to build a death ray or something. Except that time President Obama quite literally gave them orders to build a death ray. Mythbusters is about is testing out various hypotheses, and I think that we've got a big one that hasn't been thoroughly tested. Which one is that? Well, it is Archimedes' solar ray. 
In a 2011 lecture, Savage said he'd never met anyone with as much charisma as Obama. Then Obama walks in and immediately releases all the tension. I've never seen anything like it. He walked in, he introduced himself to us, he shook hands with the crew. The former president goes on to gently admonish Savage and Jamie Heineman for failing to thoroughly test the solar ray back in 2006, when they first attempted to create it. The likely mythical device dates all the way back to the second century, and it was designed to ignite the sails of enemy ships with highly focused mirrors. The team recruited 500 people with mirrors to retry the experiment. Once again, they failed to prove the concept. According to Gizmodo, the president's appearance on Mythbusters was actually part of a White House initiative to get kids more interested in science. And let's face it, a death ray is the perfect gateway drug to the world of physics and beyond. Keep those mirrors on the sail! Uh, ooh, he just took out one of your great cameramen! Granty Mahara, part of the Discovery Channel's Mythbusters build team for 10 years, once told Machine Design, When I was a kid, I never wanted to be James Bond. I wanted to be Q, because he was the guy who made all the gadgets. Throughout his career, he did exactly that, a career which ended with his death on Monday, July 13th of a brain aneurysm. He was just 49 years old. Imahara was more than just a TV host. Born in 1970 in Los Angeles, Imahara graduated with a degree in electrical engineering from the University of Southern California, as Rolling Stone reports. For a time, he had considered switching majors to screenwriting, but fortunately for all of us, he kept to that childhood career path, becoming that Q figure for big-budget films across the spectrum of science fiction and fantasy. His electrical engineering expertise expanded to robotics, serving him and the entertainment industry very well. I started out playing with Lego, and so the idea of building things was ingrained. It was something that I'd love to do. As The Hollywood Reporter tells us, he first landed a job with Industrial Light and Magic in THX Labs, the Lucasfilm's special effects companies founded by George Lucas in 1975. There, he worked as an animatronics engineer and model maker. Besides designing light displays for R2-D2, he operated the droid in the Star Wars prequels. His engineering expertise, combined with a love of entertainment and storytelling, also shows up in his work on such films as The Lost World Jurassic Park, Terminator 3 Rise of the Machines, and the sequels to The Matrix, among others. He struck his career arc early, telling Machine Design in 2008, I like the challenge of designing and building things, figuring out how something works and how to make it better or apply it in a different way. I guess you could say that engineering came naturally. Imahara started stepping in front of the camera in 2000, when he competed on Comedy Central's BattleBots. His middleweight entry in the competition, which he built himself, was christened Dead Blow. The first season, Dead Blow was the runner-up in its category, and was the first ranked robot in the series' third season. Both Adam Savage and Jamie Heineman worked on BattleBots as well. Proving that show business is a small world after all, history took a turn for the delightful when Imahara joined Mythbusters, becoming part of the build team in 2005. The program set out to do exactly what its title suggested, take on legends, myths, and Hollywood set pieces to see which fanciful ideas might actually work in real life. As a member of the build team, Imahara worked with Kerry Byron and Tony Belechi. Belechi had been one of his colleagues at ILM and is credited with recruiting Imahara for the show. Imahara did more than lend technical experience and practical expertise to the episodes. Imahara brought with him a remarkable fearlessness as well, participating in some of the experiments. If a myth test was judged too dangerous for actual humans, Imahara's team designed machines that would take the place of a person. Besides his Mythbusters work, Imahara worked behind the scenes to create a skeleton robot sidekick for Craig Ferguson's late-night talk show, a creature dubbed Jeff Peterson. In front of the cameras, he portrayed Hikaru Sulu in the fan-made web series Star Trek Continues. In 2014, the build team was removed from the Mythbusters equation, but two years later, the three experts reunited for a Netflix series, The White Rabbit Project. In that program, Imahara and his colleagues investigated not only inventions, but also crime history, a kind of how-did-they-do-that approach. Imahara's co-workers issued statements of appreciation for his presence in their lives. Adam Savage of Mythbusters tweeted, Grant was a truly brilliant engineer, artist, and performer, but also just such a generous, easygoing, and gentle person. Working with Grant was so much fun. I'll miss my friend. The Discovery Channel said in a statement, Grant was part of the Mythbusters team for 10 years, where his dedication to his craft and his ability to bust myths with the best of them brought tech to life for his fans. He became engaged to costume designer Jennifer Newman in 2016, who wrote, He was so generous and kind, so endlessly sweet, and so loved by his incredible friends. 
I feel so lucky to have known him, to have loved and been loved by him. The original Mythbusters ran for a whopping 14 seasons, and during that time, the public fell in love with both the busting and the busters. Because of that widespread love and popularity, you might think you know all the secrets behind the making of this explosively entertaining show. But there are a few secrets the cast kept to themselves after the cameras stopped rolling, just waiting for the right fans to discover. The Whole Premise Originally, Mythbusters was going to be quite literal, exploring well-known urban legends and actual myths. Over time, though, they dropped that idea, becoming more focused on what their viewers would like to see. Hence, some of the fan-favorite episodes explore whether certain movie scenes could realistically happen or whether MacGyver could actually escape certain death time and time again. While these are definitely sillier concepts than the original premise of the show, in a world dominated by improbable blockbuster movies and amazing, potentially fake YouTube clips, the Mythbusters had plenty of material to work with. And if they ever come back, they'll still have plenty to work with because we're just as confused now as we were then. The labor involved in building this ball was intense. Destroyed evidence. The Mythbusters were never strangers to destroying things. Invariably, testing various myths turned into an excuse to blow something up. However, there was one time where they used their destructive power to hide something from the fans instead of sharing it with them. At the Silicon Valley Comic Con in 2016, Adam Savage talked about their investigation of an easily available material and its supposed explosive properties. The discovery was so explosive that we destroyed the footage and agreed never to say what we learned. Seriously. Apparently, the tech-savvy team determined that destroying the footage was the only way to ensure it didn't pop up on YouTube a few years down the line, causing amateurs everywhere to go and blow themselves to bits. Um, it was absolutely terrifying. Savage on Sesame Street. Over the years, Adam Savage has become a brand in and of himself, known the world over for his madcap personality and penchant for destructive myth-busting. Appropriately enough for the zany host, Savage made his television debut as a cartoon character on Sesame Street. Savage's father was behind many of the 30-second animated bits that ran in between other Sesame Street programming way back in the day. This led to a job where Savage's father had to produce 10 animations about children who were interested in figuring out how things work. Fittingly enough for a future MythBuster, young Savage was tapped to be the voice of one of the two children featured in these spots. I'll show you how a faucet works, Sheila. Belechi Pipe Bomb for most of the Mythbusters crew, mastering the art of crazy explosions was mostly a matter of keeping fans happy. After all, most of them had backgrounds in modeling, engineering, and robotics for the movie industry. But the team had a secret weapon in the form of Tori Belechi. When he was giving a speech to the Davidson County Community College, Belechi let slip that, at the tender age of 11, he was not only learning how to make his own Super 8 films, but making his own flamethrower and even pipe bombs. While these are the kinds of skills that would probably get most modern children put on a governmental watch list, they served as valuable experience for the young man figuring out how to use the resources around him to achieve explosive entertainment. You wonder why you always see him getting hurt. Cannonball. Normally, the Mythbusters are paragons of safety. Not only do they give that firm do-not-try-this-at-home warning to their viewers, but they operate in conjunction with local law enforcement and emergency services to make sure their myth-busting doesn't do any real damage. But one screw-up was a doozy, involving the team nearly destroying somebody's home. The team was testing myths related to homemade cannons and had set up water vats that were supposed to safely catch the cannonballs so nothing dangerous happened. Unfortunately, a cannonball blew through the cinder block wall on the side of the show. It ended up going on a rather amazing journey in which it flew through somebody's front door, up their stairs, through their bedroom, and out of their house before jumping a thoroughfare, hitting the top of another home, and coming to a final rest by slamming into a minivan. Fortunately, only the minivan was hurt. Well, it radically altered our entire safety procedure. Social Media Backlash because their show is supposed to be based around rigorous scientific testing, the public is likely to assign a certain weight to endorsements the Busters make. So, most of the Mythbusters team have shied away from any kind of corporate involvement or sponsorship. All of this serves to partially explain why Grant Imahara received a lot of online criticism for his appearance in advertisements involving McDonald's products. The ad campaign featured Imahara myth-busting McDonald's myths, saying that chicken nuggets aren't made from pink slime and that, contrary to bizarre rumors, McRibs don't contain eyeballs or lips. Are there lips and eyeballs in there, Jimmy? However, the ads were weirdly specific. People who had never heard bizarre myths about eyeballs in their food were now, well, eyeballing their food choices more carefully. And the media had a field day, criticizing Imahara for selling out in the wake of being fired from Mythbusters. There's no mystery. I've seen it with my own eyes. I've been there. Regular fighting. 
In 2014, the Mythbusters were making headlines in a much more negative way than usual. Rumors swirled that the two main busters, Adam Savage and Jamie Heineman, always such a successful team on screen, actually hated each other off screen. Savage clarified that the two consider themselves as professionals who share a highly specific job, and they manage to get over any differences that they may have in the name of accomplishing this goal. As Savage put it, We disagree about the small details every single day, on almost every single detail, but we don't really disagree about the big stuff. It's interesting to imagine, then, that some of the playful insults they toss each other's way on the show may actually have a real bite to them. Wait, are you going to let me show you up on television? You want to get whacked in the head with a phone book? <laughs> Adam Savage spent 13 years blowing up things on Mythbusters, probably one of the coolest jobs in the world. But Adam Savage is more than just the sum of all the things he's exploded. He's worked on Star Wars and done a lot else besides. Here's the untold truth of Adam Savage. Sesame Street played a big role in Adam Savage's life, and not in the same way it did for most kids who grew up in the 70s. Adam Savage is artistic, creative, and clever, and it's probably not a stretch to say that some of that came from his dad, Whitney Lee Savage, who was an animator on Sesame Street and also did work for another popular children's television show called The Electric Company. And he's found it. A rubber glove sandwich. Writing for AV Club, Savage said his dad spent two or three months a year drawing and animating 30-second spots for Sesame Street. His dad's involvement with the show eventually led to Savage's first acting job. He did the voice work for a series of Sesame Street spots that taught kids how common household objects worked. I'll show you how a faucet works, Sheila. You turn the handle and it releases a rain cloud named Sam inside the faucet. Savage also got a lot of inspiration from his dad's work, experimenting with claymation and animation, and even doing a spot for Swatch in 1988. He said, Those simple animations are what I thought of as dad's work growing up. To me, they represent a creative brain allowed to run free. What more can one ask? The kid version of Adam Savage once had some pretty lofty career ambitions, as in, he just wanted to get paid to play with toys all the time. He told The Sneeze that before he ever wanted to work in special effects or blow things up for a living, he wanted to be a Lego designer. He said, Hands down, the best toy ever has to go Lego. I mean, Lego fueled my desire to build things from age 5 to age 17, I think. Savage didn't become a Lego designer, but that desire to build undoubtedly led him to a career in special effects and later to his career in explosions and disagreeing with Jamie Heineman all the time. This is exactly what I imagined being a mad scientist would be like when I was a child. Just about everyone who's lived in the United States during the 80s remembers Mr. Whipple. While today's Charmin commercials feature animated bears alluding to their number two bathroom activities, yesterday's Charmin commercials featured an old grocer named Mr. Whipple, who got really bent out of shape when customers dared to squeeze the Charmin. Squeeze Charmin, squeeze Charmin, Zach. According to SF Gate, by the time Adam Savage was a teenager, he decided that maybe acting was his thing. And because people who are new to acting don't turn down roles, no matter how silly they are, his legacy includes a brief stint in one of the Mr. Whipple commercials, where he played an apron-clad stock boy named Jimmy. Mr. Whipple, the roof is leaking all over the new Charmin! And because that's not 80s nostalgic enough, he also appeared in the 1985 Billy Joel music video You're Only Human, Second Wind, in which he played a kid who is rescued from drowning as Billy Joel goes fishing in a black overcoat. There was really no other time like the 80s. What's the world's coolest job, besides blowing stuff up for the Discovery Channel? Designing models for Star Wars. Not only did he spend 13 years on Mythbusters, before that he worked for Industrial Light & Magic as a model designer. I worked on Episodes 1 and 2. Okay. Sorry about that. For Adam Savage, watching Star Wars was a life-changing experience. According to StarWars.com, Savage grew up reading Star Wars and special effects magazines, so by the time he landed a job at ILM, he not only understood the Star Wars universe, he also knew how to create it. He explained, I had a reputation at Industrial Light & Magic for being quite fast and that afforded me some really cool jobs. But after three years at ILM, Savage says he started to become restless. That's when he got the opportunity to work at Mythbusters, the other most awesome job of all time. And he still got to play with Star Wars toys. Nice bucket. Thank you. 
If you know anything at all about the strained relationship between Adam Savage and co-host Jamie Heineman, you might assume that the two incompatible personalities ended up hosting Mythbusters together through some casting accident. But the truth is actually stranger than that. Savage and Heineman knew each other before Mythbusters. According to SF Gate, they worked together in the 1990s at Colossal Pictures, a special effects house in San Francisco. Savage told The Sneeze that Jamie was responsible for his first job in the movie industry. The pair collaborated for three years making models for commercials, and they also built the semi-legendary BattleBot robot Blindo. Blindo! In fact, it was Heinemann who first called Savage about doing Mythbusters. Heinemann had been approached by the show's creator, but didn't think he was interesting enough to carry the whole show on his own. So he called Savage and thus began one of the most antagonistic co-host relationships in the history of television. Those didn't sound like regular seconds. What well, kind of seconds were you counting there? Um, yeah, Two, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten? Now, some people will tell you that after 13 years of myth-busting, Savage and Heinemann actively dislike each other. But that's not accurate. Savage told Entertainment Weekly, It is true that we're not friends. We disagree about the small details every single day, on almost every single detail. But we don't really disagree about the big stuff. He added that even though they aren't friends, they do have a deep amount of respect for each other. Oh! <laughs> Holy crap! Even Adam Savage's most devoted fans aren't necessarily aware that he suffers from hearing loss. Given the nature of his job, it's tempting to conclude that the hearing loss must have happened when something blew up on the set of Mythbusters, or, more likely, when lots of things blew up on the set of Mythbusters. But explosions aren't to blame. Savage's hearing loss is actually congenital. His ears have structural problems that leave him at risk for infections, which can potentially lead to larger problems like partial facial paralysis. In an interview with Still Untitled, Savage said he's undergone a series of operations meant to correct the structural problems in his ears, but his hearing loss is still severe enough that he has to wear hearing aids. Honestly, when I don't have my hearing aids in, I start to get panicked because I can't hear anything and it's it's the world gets very small it, very quickly. Savage is open about his hearing loss and is a champion for the use of hearing aids. But if you think you have hearing loss or if you know someone who has hearing loss, go get them checked. It really will radically, radically improve it's your life. You can't call yourself a bona fide geek until you've gone to Comic-Con and awesome cosplay. According to Sci-Fi, every year Adam Savage not only goes to Comic-Con, he goes there incognito in an elaborate full-body costume that either he builds himself or commissions. I decided that I would put together an elaborate costume that covered me completely and I would walk the floor of San Diego Comic-Con anonymously. His costumes have been inspired by everything from Hellboy to Chewbacca. In 2017, he attended Comic-Con as King Arthur in a 20-pound suit of armor. The armor was made by Terry English, who also created the costumes for the 1981 film Excalibur. Unfortunately, you can't really be incognito if everyone knows you're always incognito. And Comic-Con fans in the know have made a game of trying to spot Adam Savage at the annual event. So the next time you're at Comic-Con, just look for the guy in the 100% self-contained suit who looks really hot and uncomfortable. And then ask for a selfie. He may not reveal his identity to you, but you can be pretty sure he'll let everyone in on the secret on his YouTube channel. There are some real job perks to being the star of a long-running television program in which you get to build super cool things and then blow them up. One of those perks is the paycheck. The other one is that people take you seriously even though you're pretty much the same geeky fanboy you've always been, only now you're a geeky fanboy with leverage. In 2017, Adam Savage got to appear in 2048 Nowhere to Run, a film short promoting Blade Runner 2049. According to Sci-Fi, the film takes place in a crowded underground marketplace and follows the shady activities of replicant Sapper Morton, played by Dave Bautista. Savage plays a blood bag merchant and can be seen over the shoulder of Bautista for several seconds. It's not exactly the role of a lifetime, but the awesomeness points are pretty off the charts. Every bit as much fun as you think. As you probably know, Mythbusters has been off the air for years. But at least you can still watch Adam Savage in the spinoff, Mythbusters Jr. But what about Mythbusters' other host, Jamie Heineman? So smart, so stoic, and lately, so elusive. What's he been up to lately? This is like a wheelie machine. That's great. Heinemann was quite an intriguing character long before Mythbusters came along. 
He used to run a sailing charter business in the Caribbean. Then he switched careers and started to work as a special effects artist, lending his creativity to over 800 commercials in several films, including RoboCop. Some more fun facts. He received an undergraduate degree in Russian linguistics. His mind-bending special effects work earned him honorary Doctor of Engineering degrees from Villanova University and Finland's La Penranta Lati University of Technology. Regarding the former occasion, he proudly tweeted that, I've never been there or to a white tie ceremony. I think it works for me. Heinemann was also the first of the two co-hosts to get involved in Mythbusters. After the production company behind the show approached him to host, he came up with an idea. As his official Mythbusters bio reveals, he reached out to Adam to join him, feeling that between his experience and Adam's liveliness and their straight guy foil combination, they would make a good team. It turned out to be a great call. Savage and Heinemann had known each other for years by that point, and even worked on battle robots together. Blendo! For 13 years, they hosted the show and brought science to the masses. They also created a whole lot of explosions along the way. These days, Heinemann spends more time on personal projects and new inventions. While still filming Mythbusters, he collaborated with Villanova University and the U.S. Office of Naval Research on some innovative projects. He made cool sci-fi stuff, like blast-resistant armor and robotic camera systems that track athletes at sporting events. Unsurprisingly, he's still obsessed with new technology. According to Popular Mechanics, his latest invention is a tank to help fight wildfires. It's called the Sentry, and it was built using a non-armored military tank. Heinemann reportedly bought the tank from an army surplus store. The Sentry can be driven remotely via virtual reality headset, allowing it to brave raging wildfires. What was his inspiration for the Sentry? Heinemann told Popular Mechanics that it was a robot he built for a 7-Up commercial. The robot had tank treads built into it and could be controlled remotely. It could also fire bottles of soda into the air. Heinemann explained the Sentry to design news like this. Let's say a fire makes it into a neighborhood as happens in some cases. Well, normally you'd have to evacuate, but these robotic vehicles are made from surplus U.S. military armored personnel carriers that we can repurpose. We could set up a mobile fire brigade and stop the fire. That's not the only project Heinemann's been working on. According to New Atlas, he helped design a prototype for a pair of electric shoes called Vortrex. The shoes feature wheels that, again, look like tank treads. There's also motors, Bluetooth connectivity, and infrared sensors for obstacle detection. Heinemann wants these shoes to help people walk faster with minimal effort. The idea for Vortrex grew out of Heinemann's old projects, which involved sticking cordless drill motors onto rollerblades. Heinemann created six prototypes before launching an Indiegogo campaign for the seventh sample, but it fell a little short of its goal in 2017. Beyond that, Heinemann still runs M5 Industries, where most Mythbusters episodes were filmed. He often uses the space as his own personal workshop. And according to Design News, he's been known to dip his toes in the bioengineering tech. As he tells it, bioengineering excites me the most right now. Bioengineering is having an, as yet to be fully appreciated, profound effect the ability to manipulate genes. If you're hoping for a Savage and Heinemann reunion, we have some bad news for you. In 2016, Savage told Business Insider that he and Heinemann will never work together again. But on the bright side, they're still both obsessed with science, and they still love to blow things up for the greater good. You probably know Tori Belici from Mythbusters, but the popular show isn't the only feather in his cap. He was cooking up awesome stuff long before he became a familiar face, and he's kept super busy ever since leaving the myth-busting biz. This is the untold story of Tori Belici. It's a career path that certainly befits a man who's famous for blowing things up. Tori Belici worked in special effects for quite a long time before becoming a TV star. In fact, he contributed to the god king of all geek franchises, Star Wars. Belechi's online portfolio is chock full of photos featuring him painstakingly building models of the massive Federation battleship and one of the pod racers for Star Wars Episode I, The Phantom Menace. And he worked closely with one of his future Mythbusters cohorts at Industrial Light and Magic, the special effects company founded by George Lucas in 1975. In the past, Belechi's former colleague Adam Savage has talked about their work together on a particularly difficult set piece. Tipoka City from Star Wars Episode 2 Attack of the Clones. That's where Obi-Wan Kenobi and Jango Fett fought each other, in case you haven't checked out the film recently. 
Savage even posted a photograph to his website Tested, which features them both dutifully building a Topoka City model, although he reveals the image isn't quite what it appears to be, writing that, The photo of Tori and me is actually one we call a model shop reach. These models are completely done, yet it looks like Tori and I are still model making with tools. In reality, we were asked by the ILM photographer to come back over to the set and make it look briefly like we were working on the models. That's show business for you. It's hard to imagine a show with a more absurd premise than Mythbusters, which revolved around quite literally exploding myths and urban legends. Well, leave it to Tori Belici to find a way to top it. Mythbusters' Tori Belechi hosts the ultimate heavy metal showdown. According to Wired, the myth-busting rascal found himself hosting a show called Flying Anvils in 2011. The entire premise involved contestants shooting anvils flying into the sky using controlled black powder explosions. Believe it or not, this wasn't a concept hatched by some caffeinated TV executive. Belechi was a celebrity host for the National Anvil Shooting Championship, an actual sport that Belechi says dates back 200 years. There's a lot of rules, but there's only one that matters. Make sure you're not in the wrong place when the anvil lands. If you think blasting 100-pound anvils 200 feet into the air sounds dangerous, Belechi would certainly agree with you. But in his interview with Wired, he says of the contestants, These people are the salt of the earth. They're very normal people. At first, I thought they might be super weird, but they're just so down to earth, just typical Americans. A lot of them were blacksmiths to begin with, and that's how they got into it. They take it so seriously. In 2014, Tori Belechi indulged in one of the oddest wrinkles in his professional career. According to The Verge, he took part in the famed Gumball 3000, a highly exclusive and elaborate 3,000-mile street rally and he did it with Canadian DJ Deadmau5, of all people. Belechi and Deadmau5 drove a Ferrari, a custom Ferrari 458 Italia, with a paint job named after the Nian cat meme, and it came complete with speakers that blared its maddening theme song. In fact, Belechi and Deadmau5 say they spent the race listening to that song on repeat. Of all the memes on the internet, why this one? Uh, well, it's a bit dated, because um, well, actually a friend of mine kind of invented it. Although this might seem like a strange celebrity stunt to you. After all, this was the same year Dead Mouse had a new album out, and Belechi and the rest of the build team lost their Mythbusters jobs. But Dead Mouse and Belechi clearly enjoyed their time on the road. They did suffer the occasional setback, however. At one point, the French police banned Dead Mouse from driving in the country, so Belechi had to take the wheel until they reached Spain. Nevertheless, they did rather well on the week long supercar race. In fact, when they reached the goal in Ibiza, they were awarded the biggest award, the Spirit of Gumball Prize, which is given to the team that was the most positive, had the best time, and partied the hardest. We've told you that Tori Belechi worked for years as a special effects guy, but we need to emphasize just how sought after he was in the field. Judging by his bio and work portfolio, Belechi was one of the best in his biz, thanks in no small part to his nearly decade-long stint at Industrial Light & Magic. In fact, he's worked behind the scenes on some of the most beloved franchises out there. Apart from his aforementioned work on Star Wars, he's built models for several movies in the Matrix trilogy, specifically The Matrix Reloaded and The Matrix Revolutions. In fact, here he is working on a control tower in Zion, the last human city on Earth. As a model builder, his resume also includes Terminator 3 Rise of the Machines, Starship Troopers, and Galaxy Quest, as well as work on Van Helsing and the 2003 version of Peter Pan but he's worked in plenty of other corners of Hollywood as well. For instance, he was a set designer for 2002's Scooby-Doo movie and worked on props for Bicentennial Man. And all this work was before we got to know him through his Mythbusters gig. Quite the impressive work ethic. These days, Belechi is best known as a TV personality, but he's also dabbled on the other side of the camera. And we're not just talking about his special effects either. It turns out Belechi also wrote and directed a short sci-fi movie while studying at San Francisco State University's film school. The film is called Sand Trooper, and it's a post-apocalyptic adventure that he made as his senior thesis. He's so proud of the film, it's even included in the biography on his website, which mentions that, 
Sand Trooper played at the Slam Dance Film Festival and also aired on Sci-Fi Channel. The short, which credits him with his full name, Salvatore Bellacci, takes place in a post-apocalyptic desert where a lone soldier tries to infiltrate a mysterious facility. We have to admit that the special effects, while rudimentary, are pretty darn neat. We won't spoil anything here, but if you ever find yourself in a Mad Max-inspired wasteland, it's probably best to avoid petting mysterious mice. Oh wait, we kind of did spoil that, huh? Since leaving the show, Tori Bellacci has somewhat struggled to replicate the success of Mythbusters. His first post-Mythbusters show was Thrill Factor, where he and Carrie Byron took their scientific approach to amusement park rides. Sadly, the show only received a single season in 2015, but at least it fared better than their proposed science-themed prank show, Frankenstein. Alas, Frankenstein was never picked up, although Byron is reportedly still holding out hope. White Rabbit Project, the build team's most recent effort, wasn't too lucky either. In 2017, Belechi confirmed on Reddit that Netflix had chosen against renewing the show for a second season, leading one fan to comment, Tell Netflix I hate them, please and thank you. Another ill-fated show was Punkin' Chunkin', a pumpkin destruction-themed Science Channel Thanksgiving special that Belechi co-hosted for several years. According to CNN, the show is incredibly popular, even topping ratings monsters like The Apprentice. But thanks to the obvious safety risks involved in shooting large pumpkins 4,000 feet into the air, the production was plagued by several injuries. Due to a lawsuit by a volunteer who got injured in an ATV accident, the event was canceled in both 2014 and 2015. And just as they were gearing up to return in 2016, a producer almost died when an air cannon exploded. Clearly, fans of the event were disappointed with this development. As far as I'm, you know, they should be able to continue going on with it, you know, just to let people know, hey, actions do happen. According to Entertainment Weekly, Tori Bellacci and Grant Imahara ended up in the middle of Los Angeles' LAX airport when a gunman terrifyingly opened fire inside Terminal 3 in 2013. Their trip to Science Channel's annual Pumpkin Chunkin competition in Delaware soon turned into a full-on panic as they ended up right in the thick of things. Belechi told Entertainment Weekly, It was like my worst nightmare. You hear about these situations on the news, but to actually see it, to see people running, leaving stuff behind, crawling over each other, crying, you always wonder how you'll respond. Belechi was reportedly at a gate that was dangerously close to the shooter, and everyone was running his way when the first shot rang out. What's more, there seemed to be nowhere to go, as he told CNN. We were kind of trapped at the end of the terminal. Now, I never saw the shooter, but we heard the shots. Eventually, someone opened the doors and let them out on the tarmac. Belechi and Imahara's live tweets were some of the first reports of the incident to emerge from the scene, with Belechi writing, Shooters in LAX. That was thing terrifying. Tori Belechi seems to be intensely private. Even the most tenacious gossip sites can't seem to agree on anything conclusive about his relationships and other personal matters. Perhaps due to this lack of solid information, many sites address common rumors, including reports that he dates, or used to date, former Mythbusters co-star Carrie Byron. That's not true. They're simply good friends. Evidently, Belechi is A-OK -okay with keeping personal matters personal. However, he has been known to indulge in the occasional social media post with an apparent girlfriend. The website Hollywood Mask seems to think that a few 2013 tweets suggest he was romantically involved with Francesca Gehrig, a former senior production coordinator for Mythbusters. After all, they tell each other, love you, for all the world to see. More recently, and more promisingly, a woman who goes by the name Aaron B. on Instagram has posted some rather romantic images featuring Belechi. One post even reveals that they might be tying the knot in the near future. To be clear, Aaron B. wrote in April 2019, Can't believe I get to marry this stud. You heard it here first. Maybe. Religion doesn't seem to go hand in hand with all the mad scientist antics on Mythbusters, but Tori Belechi is reportedly a man of faith. According to the Monterey County Herald, he's a devout Christian, and that makes him something of an outlier among his fellow former Mythbusters. 
According to Skeptical Inquirer, Adam Savage thinks of himself as an atheist, freethinker, humanist, and yes, a skeptic. Meanwhile, in a 2014 Reddit Ask Me Anything, Jamie Heineman plainly stated that he doesn't think too highly of religion, writing that, Atheism or agnosticism or whatever movement doesn't affect me at all. I don't believe in anything. There are only probabilities, and the probability of a deity or some sh** is pretty f***ing low. IMHO. Even Belaychi's close pal Carrie Byron has said, I am an atheist, but I don't begrudge anyone for whatever belief systems they hold. Tori Belaychi comes across as a pretty great guy on TV, and in real life, he seems to dial that kindness up to 11. The Monterey County Herald reports that Belaychi decided to take a trip abroad when Mythbusters took a brief hiatus in 2010, but instead of indulging in a luxurious holiday, he flew to Haiti to do some important volunteer work. Joining forces with the nonprofit organization Life Giving Force, Belaychi visited orphanages in the country in the aftermath of a catastrophic 7.0 earthquake on January 12, 2010. He helped local communities gain access to clean, safe water by building water cleaning systems. The little guys like this are getting clean water so they're not getting sick anymore. Belaychi was impressed by how the orphanages aimed to educate the kids, as he told the Monterey County Herald. One of the pastors said, if we can educate 5,000 to 6,000 kids over the years, these kids are going to grow up and you're going to have a whole generation of leaders. And that's what he was saying they need in order to change Haiti. He blows up things for kicks. He helps people in need. He's basically the perfect human. And that's no myth. Some absurd movie tropes are so pervasive that you almost believe they can happen in real life. That's why Adam Savage, Jamie Heineman, and the rest of the Mythbusters crew have tested dozens of movie myths over the years. Here are some of the most memorable cinematic myth busts. In the original Point Break, Keanu Reeves plummets to Earth with a gang of surfing bank robbers as the score plays melodramatically in the background and everyone in the audience sighs in satisfied happiness. Skydiving is an activity that some people do every day for reasons that remain totally unclear to the rest of us who'd rather not fall out of a plane. In Point Break, the skydiving buddies join hands as the ground rapidly approaches. They then proceed to have a conversation about how awesome the experience is. They may be shouting, but we're led to believe that they can all clearly hear and understand each other, which seems a bit fishy. How do you like it, Johnny? Amazing! The Mythbusters thought so too, and in one episode, they decided to test this scenario by making Grant jump out of a plane. While in freefall, he was approached by a skydiving instructor who was asked to shout a specific phrase several times, but Grant was unable to understand the words. That's because in freefall, the sound of rushing air drowns out the sound of a human voice. Thus, the myth was busted. Incidentally, it also takes around 31 seconds to fall 4,000 feet, whereas in the movie, the freefall took three times that long, so that myth was busted as well. Maybe you didn't notice through all your salty tears, but when Jack and Rose are floating around in the ice-cold North Atlantic at the end of Titanic, there's a moment when they both could have been saved. Or at least that's what people were saying back in 2012, around the time of Titanic's 3D re-release, when someone released a bunch of photos showing all the different ways that both Jack and Rose could have fit together on that floating door. You can't ever bust a myth until you actually do it for real, though. To honor the 15th anniversary of the movie, Mythbusters decided to find out if it really was possible for both Jack and Rose to survive the sinking of the unsinkable liner. Titanic director James Cameron told Adam and Jamie that the door wouldn't have been buoyant enough to support both of them, but full-scale testing seemed to prove otherwise. In fact, Adam and Jamie boosted the door's buoyancy by tying a life jacket underneath it. They were both able to climb on and stay more or less out of the water. Cameron, however, was unmoved. The script says Jack dies. He has to die. So maybe we screwed up and the board should have been a little tiny bit smaller, but the dude's going down. <laughs> James Bond films are full of ridiculous gadgets and action sequences and improbable ideas, like Bond somehow managing to never get an STD. But most of that just gets overlooked because it's James Bond and he's awesome, and who really cares whether or not science agrees with anything he does? But some of the dumb stuff in 007's adventures really does need to be myth-busted, especially that goofy scene in Goldfinger in which Jill Masterson gets smothered in gold paint and dies. Mythbusters called BS on that one, and both Adam and Jamie went under the brush to see if they could survive being covered in gold paint. Jamie seemed to have a weird blood pressure response, though doctors speculated it was probably just because his blood pressure tended 
intended to be high anyway. Meanwhile, Adam had a drop in body temperature, which may have had more to do with the fact that he was essentially naked except for the paint. But neither of them suffered any serious physical consequences. Well, maybe except for the rectal thermometer, which was certainly uncomfortable, though far from lethal. If you ever find yourself dangling from a ledge by your fingertips, that's no big deal. Just hang on for a few minutes and help will arrive soon enough. We've seen this happen often enough in the movies to know that ledge dangling is just a temporary problem. After all, Frodo Baggins could do it even when he was short one finger. It turns out we were right about one thing. Ledge dangling is only temporary, because nobody can hang on to one for as long as movies imply that we can. When the Mythbusters team tested this out, they found that everyone who tried it was able to hold on to the ledge for just one minute, and that was only because they had about three inches of space to hang on to. When the space was reduced, their times were cut down to between 30 and 40 seconds, with the exception of Grant, who couldn't get a grip at all with a half-inch ledge. So unless someone happens to be standing by with a safety net or a large bucket of styrofoam peanuts, your chances of surviving a ledge dangle really aren't that encouraging. Shooting around corners is something that cool characters are known to do in certain action movies. This trope might not be as prevalent as some of the others the Mythbusters have tested over the years, but what gun-toting movie hero or villain doesn't wish for a device that will let them shoot around a corner? Mythbusters tested a couple of myths related to this idea. In the first, they bent the barrel of a rifle and tested it to see if the bullet would exit the barrel with actual lethal force. Surprisingly, or perhaps unsurprisingly, it did. On another episode, they tested a specific myth perpetrated by the 2008 movie Wanted, in which the characters can curve bullets just by swinging their arms. When the Mythbusters tried it out, they were unable to duplicate the feat using normal humans, though it sure looked like they were all having fun trying. I have to look at the high speed, but I'm pretty sure I curved that one. Just to be sure, they also rigged a robotic arm to swing twice as fast as a human arm, but the bullet still left the gun in a straight line. One of the most memorable scenes in Pirates of the Caribbean The Curse of the Black Pearl happens when Jack Sparrow and Will Turner use an upside-down rowboat as an improvised submarine. They walk underwater with the boat over their heads, and the camera cuts to them inside the boat, where there's a pocket of air that lets them breathe while sneaking across the ocean floor. This is either madness or brilliance. It's remarkable how often those two traits coincide. But then the Mythbusters crew had to come along and ruin it all. In one episode, they tested the rowboat myth as well as a couple of others from popular pirate movies. When they tried to walk into the water with the boat over their head, they found that they weren't able to actually drag it down with them because their bodies were too buoyant. 60 pounds of pirate gear didn't weigh them down enough, nor did 500 pounds of weight on the boat itself. In the end, they figured it would take about 2,000 pounds of force to keep the boat underwater, which means there's really no way Jack and Will could have pulled this one off, no matter how mad or brilliant. Is it possible that the Mythbusters could ever be wrong? Almost certainly not. They are science incarnate. They might occasionally send cannonballs through random suburban neighborhoods, but they're never wrong, not even when it comes to a galaxy far, far away. In the Mythbusters Star Wars special, Adam made a tauntaun out of foam, synthetic skin, and fur. The crew stuffed the fake carcass full of fake organs and then put a dummy with a circulatory system called Thermo Boy inside of it. They then warmed the gross duo to 99 degrees and placed them in a negative 40 degree refrigerator. Jamie and Adam reasoned that Han Solo would have needed two and a half hours to build the shelter, and by the end of that time period, Thermo Boy's temperature had only dropped to 92 degrees. This myth was thus deemed plausible. So, if you had access to the large thermal mass of a large animal and could get inside it, it might just save your life. Not everyone agrees with them, though. In 2012, io9 came to the conclusion that Luke would have been a goner inside the Tauntaun, though they used some slightly different numbers to arrive at that conclusion. Like the Mythbusters, they decided on a starting body temperature of 95 degrees, since Luke was probably already in a mild state of hypothermia, but they calculated an outside temperature of negative 60 instead of negative 40. Using those numbers as a baseline, they figured that Han only had about 47 minutes to get Luke inside a real shelter. They didn't have a fake Tauntaun to try it out on, though, so we'll give the edge to the Mythbusters plausible conclusion. Indiana Jones is all kinds of awesome, especially with a bullwhip. He uses it to swing across holes in the floor of scary jungle temples, to yank a hot poker out of a Nazi's hand, and even to save his dad from falling off a tank. 
Mythbusters did a whole episode on Indy, and they had plenty to say about bullwhips. In one segment, Adam and Jamie made a chasm out of shipping boxes and put a wooden post over the top to simulate a tree branch. When they covered the post with sandpaper, which is more similar to the bark of a tree than sanded wood is, Adam was able to cross the simulated chasm via bullwhip. The pair also tried to master hitting a small target with a bullwhip, which is evidently not as easy as Indy makes it look. They brought in a whip expert, and after that, Jamie was able to snag Adam's hand with the whip, which would have been enough to throw off his aim. Adam was then able to strike Jamie's gloved hand, which would have been enough to make an ungloved hand drop its weapon. Both myths were thus deemed plausible. Jaws is a classic of blockbuster and horror filmmaking. Any movie about the hunt for a man-eating great white shark is going to be thrilling. So did Steven Spielberg really need the climax to be an explosion? Of course he did. It's not like you could kill a giant shark with a whale-sized harpoon gun or something obvious. But could you actually blow up a scuba tank by shooting it while it's lodged inside the mouth of a very big fish? Smile, you son of a This myth ended up being busted not just once, but twice. Shooting the scuba tank in the mouth of a fake shark did nothing until the crew tried shooting it with a 50 caliber sniper rifle. Even then, it didn't explode, though it was punctured as the bullet propelled down its gullet and out the tail end. So it would have been a kill shot for sure, just not the dramatic explosion shown in the movie. In Kill Bill Vol. 2, the bride finds herself in a coffin. Unlike an average person, she doesn't freak out and end up dying from oxygen deprivation within a few minutes because of hysterical screaming. Instead, she keeps her cool and punches a hole in the coffin. Then she climbs out through the dirt, literally rising from the grave, thus giving hope to all humans who have ever been terrified of waking up inside a coffin. But then Mythbusters had to go and snatch all that hope away. The crew built a punching robot that could generate the same force as a human punch, put the poor thing inside a pine coffin, and let it try to punch its way out. The robot punched the lid 600 times and barely cracked it. So the Mythbusters then decided to see if it would be possible to dig yourself out through the dirt. They tested that out by using a coffin with a sliding trap door in it that allowed dirt inside. When buried six feet under, the coffin filled with dirt so quickly that it would have been impossible to get out before suffocating. Perhaps we should return to the practice of equipping coffins with bells on strings, just in case. There's life after Mythbusters, especially for Adam Savage, who now gets to live a life of building cool stuff and messing around all day while somehow still making a pretty tidy living from it. So, what has Adam Savage been up to since Mythbusters? Keep watching to find out. For Mythbusters Jr., Savage has replaced his old co-host, the stalwart, uber-serious Jamie Heineman, with a bunch of teens and preteens. They're not just any teens and preteens, though. They're the sorts of kids who make you reflect on your own life with deep regret and wonder why you weren't building robots, programming computers, shooting off rockets, and inventing other stuff well before you hit puberty. Plus, Savage's new co-hosts seem like they might be at least marginally easier to work with than Heinemann. If nothing else, they at least express occasional emotion. Savage said at the Summer Television Critics Association press tour in 2018, When big things fall on big things, the pure delight on their faces, they can't hide it. That's why we're doing this. But don't let the presence of minors lull you into a false sense of responsible science or anything. It's not a show about teaching these guys how to do stuff. It's not a kid's show. These are the new Mythbusters, and I'm their camp counselor and their advisor and sometimes their test subject. They're going to be blowing stuff up just as big as we did. So, just to confirm, the show's premise is to give explosives to children and let them blow stuff up on national television, right? Cool. Adam Savage is the bromance every dude wishes he could have. Imagine hanging out in your workshop and building stupid stuff all day over a six-pack of beer. Heck, even most women probably wish they could have a bromance with Adam Savage. Sadly, the closest you'll probably ever come to being pals with Adam Savage is when you read his book, which has the very relatable title, Every Tool's a Hammer. Because who among us hasn't beaten a doorknob to death with a heavy flashlight just because you locked your keys in the house? One Boing Boing reviewer called Savage's book a wonderful read in which Adam shares his own personal guidelines for creativity from inspiration to execution. So if you've ever wanted to build a giant Totoro costume and all you really need is some inspiration to get started, well, this book might help you out with that. Savage calls the book, quote, a chronicle of my life as a maker, but it's really a love letter to other makers and those of us who want to be makers but still haven't grabbed the airbrush by the trigger. He wrote, grab hold of the things you're interested in that fascinate you and dive deeper into them to see where they lead you. 
If you follow Savage's activities online, then you probably get the feeling that making, which is essentially just the blanket term for the art of building random cool stuff, is going to one day save the world and all of the universe too. In late 2016, Savage announced a new nonprofit called Nation of Makers, which helps makers share ideas, projects, resources, and whatever else they feel like sharing with the broader maker community. We are a nation of makers, of artists, of sculptors, of writers, of singers, of dancers, explorers, and storytellers. According to Nation of Makers website, the mission is to build a society where everyone has access to the tools, technologies, experiences, and knowledge to make anything. Naturally, Savage is on the board of directors, so the organization is off to a solid start at making the world a better place. Adam Savage is, among other things, a huge fan of sci-fi in general and Blade Runner in particular. And if you're Adam Savage, well, you can do things like call up the studio and say, hey, I want to be an extra. And then the next thing you know, you're on the set of a Blade Runner 2049 short getting ready to play a street merchant in future Los Angeles. In the short, Savage appears in the background just behind Dave Bautista. His character doesn't have any lines, but he can be seen trying to sell bags of blood to a vendor because the Blade Runner universe is gross. But it's not a blink and you'll miss it appearance. Any true Mythbusters fan would be able to identify him without much effort, even if they didn't know in advance he was there. And filmmaking opportunities seem to keep presenting themselves. According to Tested, in 2018, Savage visited Peter Jackson's Weta workshop in New Zealand and made a short film entitled Farewell to Arms, which features himself in a suit of armor and a bright red skirt fighting some weird creature that looks like a Buffy the Vampire Slayer demon mixed with one of the rubber suits from the set of the original Star Trek. After a short battle, the demon removes one of Savage's arms, Monty Python style, complete with gushing blood. The film is presented as a part of a series, and it isn't just an original story with relatively low-budget special effects. It's also a behind-the-scenes look at how Weta Workshop puts together an epic film like Lord of the Rings. Both Adam Savage and Jamie Heineman seem to be cool with the end of Mythbusters. After so many seasons of working with someone you don't actually really like that much, it was comfortable for them to finally part ways. But knowing Adam Savage the way we do, it must have been hard for him to put all that geeking out behind him. Because if there's one thing Adam Savage clearly loves to do, it's geeking out in a public forum. Oh, there we go. There we go. Oh, it's actively moving. Look at that. <laughs> That's probably one of the reasons he signed on to host a 2017 15-part sci-fi podcast called Sci-Fi 25 Origin Stories. The series featured discussions with some legendary names in science fiction, like the voice of Yoda, Frank Oz, Star Trek screenwriter DC Fontana, and writer Ron Moore, who won an Emmy for his work on Battlestar Galactica. So not only did Savage get to spend lots of time talking publicly about science fiction, he got to do it with some of the biggest names in the industry. Savage told Space.com that the series was meant to examine science fiction not just as a genre, but as a cultural force that transcends petty human differences. He said, That's what science fiction has always been to me, a wonderful Trojan horse that bypasses people's partisan filters to talk about culturally important issues. Adam Savage is a mythbuster, a maker, a special effects guy, and now a purveyor of travel accessories. Yes, one of Savage's latest projects is selling bags made out of recycled sails. According to Wired, he designs the bags in collaboration with the San Francisco company called Mafia Bags and markets them under his Savage Industries brand. Wired reports that the recycled sails give each bag, quote, unique quirks as well as a broken-in look. They have magnet closures instead of Velcro or snaps, and a system of springs inside the lip that keeps the bag open while you're rifling around inside it. You can also get a Savage Industries beach tote or cooler. Most of the bags come in white only, presumably because sales also mostly come in white, but there's also a black version of the smaller bag available. Don't be put off by the mostly white options and the dirt that will inevitably and permanently collect on the surface of your $225 bag, though. Savage says the dirt is actually a patina, so it's all good. Even though everyone knows that patina is just a fancy word that antiques dealers use to make their customers feel good about the filth. Savage's biggest post-Mythbusters project is Tested.com, where he serves as editor-in-chief. Tested.com is an online magazine that focuses mostly on scientific topics like nature, exploration, emerging technologies, groundbreaking new products, and Adam Savage being in a Blade Runner short. 
In case you're not sold yet, here are a few recent examples from the tested lineup of awesome topics. A video profiling a spacesuit replica builder, another video that follows Savage as he builds a liquid nitrogen-powered engine for a Starbucks video, and yet another video that follows him around while he visits the Space Shuttle Discovery in Dulles, Virginia. It also seems like Savage chronicles many of his activities at the website, meaning you can geek out vicariously through someone who has enough time and money to actually geek out as a profession. If you've missed Adam Savage on Mythbusters and you think all his other projects just can't fill the void, well, you can have the experience of a lifetime at one of his live stage shows. In 2015, Savage launched Tested the Show, which is evidently loosely based on the Tested website. The show debuted at San Francisco's Castro Theater and also ran in 2016 and 2017. It has included an appearance by Simone Getch, otherwise known as the Queen of the Crappy Robots, but is mostly a celebration of multimedia, costuming, and Adam Savage's huge collection of cool stuff. But alas, it seems to have only happened a few times. But wait, according to Boing Boing, there's also The Brain Candy Show a live touring show billed as Crazy Toys, Incredible Tools, and Mind-Blowing Demonstrations for a Celebration of Curiosity that's an interactive, hands-on, minds-on theatrical experience like no other. Brain Candy wasn't a one-man show. Savage teamed up with YouTuber Michael Stevens for the event that did, in fact, feature explosions. Sadly, it only ran through May 2018, so don't bother frantically Googling for tickets. Anyone who's followed Savage, even since before he left Mythbusters, knows about his Comic-Con tradition. When he attends a big convention, Savage dresses up in a super impressive head-to-toe costume and goes incognito through the crowd, though it's kind of easy for people to figure out his identity just based on how awesome his costume is. Over the years, he's been Chewbacca, Hellboy, Kylo Ren, Totoro, and King Arthur, but his most epic costume was the one he spent 14 years and $15,000 building. He told CNBC, That's going to have to be Kane's suit from Alien. I replicated John Hurt's spacesuit costume from the movie Alien. All those years he spent on the thing included researching the costume, gathering the pieces to make it, and figuring out how to make it all fit. And Savage isn't just content to build a costume that's almost perfect. He even hired people to help him with the castings and molds. Some of the materials came from as far away as Italy and China. Admittedly, $15,000 is a lot to spend on one costume, but Savage says it helped that it took him so long to actually complete the project. I spread it out over 15 years so it didn't hurt my wallet as bad as it would have in one fell swoop, though. Adam Savage is a dad, and like all dads, he has a special appreciation for kids and young people. So when he decided to undertake a huge project in the celebration of the Apollo 11 moon landing, he recruited 40 different makers from all over the country, including a group of students from Kennedy High in Richmond, California. Together, the group created life-sized replica pieces of an Apollo 11 command module hatch. According to Tested, Savage used 3D scan data and original drawings kept in the Air and Space Museum archives to create a digital model of the hatch. It was then separated into individual components, which were distributed to the 40 makers who helped Savage complete the project. Unlike Savage's other projects, though, there was room for artistic license. The makers were free to create their components in any color or finish as, quote, a celebration of different fabrication techniques, some traditional, some cutting edge. The pieces were sent to the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., where Savage assembled them live in front of an audience into a complete command module hatch. Savage must have truly missed life as a TV star, because it didn't take him very long to settle back into yet another series. This time, he doesn't have to share the limelight, and his name is even in the show's title, called Savage Builds. The series airs on Discovery Channel and follows Savage as he, well, builds stuff. The show launched big with an episode featuring Savage building a flying, bulletproof Iron Man costume. Savage 3D printed the suit out of titanium, then he shot a gun at it to prove it was bulletproof. Then he enlisted the help of inventor Richard Browning, who's famous for building a working jetpack. And yes, the suit could actually fly, although Savage himself wisely decided not to be the pilot after he had some trouble mastering the whole jetpack thing. Browning made the test flight, and it was pretty impressively successful. No word yet on when the duo plans to start fighting crime. In the 15 years they spent on the air, the Mythbusters have debunked hundreds of myths, misconceptions, and urban legends, often based on scenes from popular movies. 
Here are some of the most iconic movie moments that the Mythbusters proved couldn't happen in real life. For the Mythbusters, a movie like Catherine Bigelow's Point Break is full to the brim with myths to test. The film follows rookie FBI agent Johnny Utah, played by Keanu Reeves, as he goes undercover amongst a group of daring and dangerous bank robbers known as the Ex-Presidents. Utah goes skydiving with the Ex-Presidents on multiple occasions, having several important conversations during freefall with the group's leader, Bodie, played by Patrick Swayze. Seems reasonable enough, that is, if you've never actually been skydiving. That's because skydiving is awfully loud, what with all the air constantly whooshing around. The Mythbusters wondered whether it's even remotely possible for a mid-air conversation to take place, or if a real-life point break would have actually involved a lot of mouthed words and confused looks exchanged between the film's leads. To test this theory, Grant Imahara jumped out of a plane, with a parachute of course, and was followed by a diving instructor who attempted to communicate a pre-selected phrase. Grant unsurprisingly couldn't hear a thing, quickly and thoroughly busting the myth. Maybe Bodhi should have picked a quiet beach or cafe to have his menacing conversation instead. Point Break wasn't the only time Keanu Reeves broke the laws of physics. In Jan de Bont's 1994 action thriller Speed, Keanu's SWAT cop Jack Traven races against the clock to save hostages from a bus that's been rigged to explode if it goes under 50 miles per hour. In one of the film's most memorable scenes, the bus is headed for a 50-foot gap in the road. But thanks to Keanu's quick thinking and Sandra Bullock's level-headed driving, they're able to stick the landing with no injuries to anyone on board. However, when the Mythbusters decided to try it out for themselves, their experiments uncovered some very different results. The build team first ran tests with a small-scale model, but things didn't go very well. The first test was disastrous for the miniature bus and its imaginary occupants, who went plummeting to their doom in short order. Even closing the gap didn't seem to help very much, though the build team admitted that if there were somehow concealed ramps on both sides of the gap, the movie stunt might work in the real world. Unfortunately, when they attempted to recreate the scene in full scale using a remotely operated bus, the team first found that the vehicle had a hard time getting up to the required velocity in the first place. When they scaled back the distance to account for this discrepancy, the bus still couldn't quite make the leap. Being buried alive is a pretty universal fear. Even George Washington was deathly afraid that it would happen to him. It's no surprise that the terrifying act has found its way to the big screen a number of times, but no instance of live burial on film is more iconic than the one in Kill Bill Vol. 2. In the sequel to Quentin Tarantino's hyper-violent masterpiece, Uma Thurman's katana-wielding bride finds herself in a wooden box six feet under, having been sealed there by her former associate, Bud. However, given her extensive kung fu training, the bride's got a unique plan. She's going to punch her way out. Using the one-inch punch popularized in real life by martial arts legend Bruce Lee, the bride breaks through the coffin and claws her way out of the dirt, giving her the opportunity to finish her revenge quest. But could the bride really have escaped? The Mythbusters were wondering exactly that when they decided to put it to the test in Season 6. Grant created a robot that could approximate a human punch and, more importantly, didn't need oxygen to survive. The robot put a crack in the coffin after 600 punches, but couldn't manage any further. If you can't get out after 600 punches, well, you might not be getting out. Additionally, when the build team considered what would happen when dirt began to stream into a coffin, the results were pretty dire. Tori was able to extricate himself from two feet of dirt, but six feet was just too much for a human to manage. As for the five-point palm exploding heart technique, the Mythbusters didn't feel the need to test that one out. Many Star Wars fans like to joke about the incredibly poor aim of stormtroopers, who seem doomed to endlessly shoot at the movie's heroes, yet never able to strike them. 
After analyzing several iconic Star Wars scenes, Adam Savage determined that the lasers shooting out of the Stormtroopers' blasters are alarmingly slow, moving at only 130 miles per hour. While that may still seem fast, a normal bullet on Earth moves at around 1,700 miles per hour, about 13 times faster. So, given the excruciatingly slow speed of a single blaster shot, it should be possible to outrun one, right? Could it be that Luke Skywalker didn't need superhuman abilities to dodge them all? In short, no. To test this myth, Jamie built a cannon that would fire non-lethal foam darts at the appropriate speed to mimic the blaster shots. Both hosts attempted to dodge the foam projectiles in a mock spaceship environment, but they just couldn't manage the feat. Even when they spaced out the time between shots, it didn't give the Rebels any time to avoid certain doom. Maybe it was the Force helping Luke out after all. In the 2008 film Wanted, burnt-out office worker Wesley, played by James McAvoy, finds out that he is linked to a secretive group of super-assassins known as the Fraternity. Moreover, Wesley learns that he has unique, almost mystical firearm skills, kind of like Harry Potter, but much more violent. In the role of Wesley's gun Dumbledore is Angelina Jolie, who teaches him the art of shooting bullets on a curve. This last notion, of course, is what piqued the interest of the Mythbusters. Is it really possible to somehow fling a gun around while shooting it, therefore setting its bullet on a curved path? Even if you don't account for the sort of high-level math and physics knowledge that would be necessary to skillfully control such a feat, is it even possible in the first place? Well, no, not unless you have a very strange gun. Despite their best efforts, neither the build team nor a gunslinging robot could make it happen. It only sort of worked in a later episode, Bullet Baloney, in which Jamie and Adam improbably managed to fire a bullet out of a gun with a dramatically curved barrel that could even potentially shoot backwards. The seemingly endless lineup of Fast and Furious films might have you confused about some of the best ways to drive. While the Mythbusters could already tell that some of the more elaborate stunts, like the Abu Dhabi building jump in Furious 7, are a bit too outlandish for reality, they decided to test out the drifting techniques popularized by the earlier entries in the franchise. Is drifting a car more efficient than simply guiding it through a turn? After learning how to drift a car in the first place, Adam and Jamie took to the racetrack, where they drove their cars through a series of 90-degree and 180-degree drifts. After comparing their drift runs to one with regular turns and doing the math, the pair found that drifting was only ever as good as turning, and may actually be less efficient in terms of finishing a race as fast as possible. Bluntly put, the physics of a drift just don't make sense if speed is your ultimate goal. No one tell Dominic Toretto, though, or his feelings might get hurt when he realizes he's been doing it all wrong this whole time. While real great white sharks don't actually cause that much trouble, Steven Spielberg's 1975 thriller Jaws posits that a single shark could do a whole lot of damage to one unfortunate seaside community. It's only after numerous maulings that police chief Martin Brody manages to take out the shark by throwing a scuba tank into its mouth and shooting the tank, resulting in an extremely chummy explosion. Smile, you son of a... It's a spectacular scene and an exciting climax for a classic movie, but could it happen in real life? This was the subject of two Mythbusters episodes, a 2005 Jaws special, and a 2015 update. In the first, the Mythbusters found that a tank pierced by a bullet decompressed and dramatically flung itself around, but didn't explode. A mass of fan questions over the years pushed the team to revisit the same myth a decade later, as many viewers had wondered if different kinds of bullets and trajectories might have made for a bigger explosion. Adam and Jamie set to work with a model shark they named Brewster, but the results weren't any more explosive. However, when Jamie hit the tank with a sniper rifle, the tank did shoot clean through the shark and exited near its tail. That would certainly be a very bad day for a great white, but still no boom. In the world of great movie debates, one stands out head and shoulders above the rest. 
at the end of James Cameron's 1997 historical epic Titanic, star-crossed lovers Rose and Jack find themselves falling victim to hypothermia in the freezing waters of the Atlantic Ocean, with nothing but a wooden door to keep them afloat. Since the door can't support the weight of both of them, Jack nobly sacrifices himself to save his beloved. But what if Jack never had to say goodbye? Since the film's release, fans have argued pretty strenuously over whether or not both of them could have fit on that door. So much so that it became the Mythbusters' most requested topic. First, the team used a gelatinous dummy that Jamie called Thermo Boy to prove that Jack would indeed have succumbed to hypothermia in a matter of minutes. However, when Jamie and Adam stood in for Rose and Jack, they realized that they could use a period-accurate life vest to add to the door's buoyancy. At that point, the team knew that the door was big enough to support two people after all and declared the myth busted. Sorry, Jack. Early James Bond movies are known for a lot of things like campy plots and outrageous villains, but one thing they're not known for is their realism. While the film franchises tended somewhat towards more serious settings and plots in recent years, the initial movies of the 1960s and 1970s were, sorry fans, oftentimes downright goofy. However, goofiness has never stopped the Mythbusters. In 1979's Moonraker, Roger Moore's James Bond finds himself in a cable car doomed to go down after the steel-toothed villain Jaws bites through the cables. As cool as those teeth may have been to some viewers, the Mythbusters couldn't ignore the important fact that Jaws' shiny teeth are still attached to a human musculoskeletal system. You can sharpen and strengthen those metal teeth all you want, as Jamie and Adam did, but unless Jaws was some kind of super-powered android, he simply could not have chomped through a steel cable of that size, especially not in one bite. Though it may have been forgotten by much of the movie-going public of today, Seth Rogen's attempt at rebooting The Green Hornet in 2011 provided plenty of material for a rollicking Mythbusters episode. Sure, it was basically a promotional tie-in for a movie that proved to be a critical dud, but that didn't stop the Mythbusters from putting on a good show with the help of Rogan himself. The build team tested out a couple of different movie myths from the film, but the most spectacular one involved a car, a bulldozer, and lots of explosives. In the movie, two people in a car trapped beneath a bulldozer managed to send it flying by setting off some heavy explosives, all without mortally injuring themselves in the process. Replicating that scene in real life proved to be tough. Even with some heavy-duty shielding, the dummies meant to represent the Green Hornet and his assistant Kato were seriously damaged after the first blast which didn't even move the bulldozer in the right direction. Then, in a quasi-successful attempt to get the bulldozer to fly away with 250 pounds of explosives, the car, dummies, and machinery were all torn to shreds by the blast. All this tells me is if you want to make a good movie, the first thing you got to do is throw reality out the window. That's what I've learned. In the 1964 James Bond film Goldfinger, Sean Connery's Agent 007 discovers the titular villain's employee, Jill Masterson, dead in his hotel room. The cause of death? Gold paint smeared across her entire body, which caused her to suffer fatal skin suffocation. An urban legend that persisted for a number of years posits that the actress who portrayed Jill Masterson suffered a similar fate in real life. But a bit of digging reveals that the actress in question, Shirley Eaton, is still alive and well today. She stepped away from acting in the 1960s, leading some in the pre-internet age to think that she might have died. But could being painted gold really kill a person? That was one of the first questions the Mythbusters asked in one of their pilot episodes, which aired back in 2003. Jamie was coated head to toe in gold paint for an hour and survived just fine not suffering anything besides some minor discomfort and slight fluctuations in blood pressure and body temperature. Not fun, of course, but certainly not lethal. Mythbusters is one of the most beloved shows of the century, and at the heart of the series was Tori Belechi and the build team. Every episode, Belechi, Carrie Byron, and Grant Imahara would be tasked with building whatever weird gadgets or death traps hosts Adam Savage and Jamie Heineman called for in their experiments. 
But in 2014, to the shock and dismay of Mythbusters fans everywhere, Belechi, Byron, and Imahara suddenly left the series. So what has Tori Belechi been doing since Mythbusters? The short answer, of course, is that he's still blowing stuff up, which is no surprise. He told the University of Rhode Island's A Good Five Cent Cigar that his dad taught him how to make Molotov cocktails as a kid, so it makes sense he'd still be blowing stuff up as an adult. Before joining Mythbusters, Belechi worked alongside Jamie Heineman for a while before spending several years as a model builder at Industrial Light and Magic, where he worked with Imahara. When Heineman helped launch Mythbusters in 2003, he brought Belechi along to help with their experiments. Soon, he became part of some of the most memorable stunts in the show as a designated guinea pig for many of Mythbusters' more dangerous actions. That all came to an end in 2014, though, when a salary dispute led the build team to depart in mass. Luckily, Belechi was already working on side projects, such as hosting a web series called Blow It Up, where he, wait for it, blew stuff up. Bare feet on your couch? That's disgusting. No amount of cleaning is going to get rid of that filth, but JD and I can by blowing it up. And he also teamed up with his Mythbusters castmate Carrie Byron as co-hosts of Thrill Factor, a show on the Travel Channel that had both hosts try an adrenaline-pumping amusement park rides and water slides. The entire Mythbusters build team then reunited in 2016 for the Netflix show White Rabbit Project, once again using science and engineering to investigate topics like superpowered technology and jailbreaks. The program challenged each host to recreate some of these technologies, but with far fewer explosions and Mythbusters. Unfortunately, White Rabbit Project was cancelled by Netflix after a single season. But thanks to his unique set of skills, Belechi is never away from TV for too long, and his new Science Channel series, The Explosion Show, premiered in January 2020. The show takes Belechi and Daredevil and stunt performer Street Bike Tommy Passamonte behind the scenes of the many explosions that happen every day. Typical episodes show the two visiting a bomb squad, making their own fireworks show, or seeing how Hollywood creates movie explosions. Belechi also signed a deal to host a new show on Amazon with Top Gear's Richard Hammond. Inspired by classic stories such as Robinson Crusoe, the show called Great Escapist put Belechi and Hammond on a deserted island, where they are challenged to transform the location from an inhospitable death trap into an island paradise, using materials gathered from a shipwreck or from the island itself. Great Escapist filmed in Panama and premiered in early 2021. Belechi said one of the hardest challenges of the show was that he was required to act, but one thing he didn't have to fake was being worried, because he revealed that he and Hammond almost got stuck on the island for real. They finished filming just a week before global lockdown started due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's not all. In 2021, Belechi is set to debut a brand new Mythbusters show. Yes, it's true. Produced by Motor Trend and Mythbusters creators Beyond Productions, the streaming series is called Motor Mythbusters and will have Belechi teaming up with mechanic Bay Hadley and engineer and race car driver Busy Azirioha. The show will confirm or bust many urban legends around vehicles and answer fans' burning questions about car chases and car crashes. Build them and then blow them up. Sounds like Belechi is finally back home.